entrepreneurial, leadership, intellectual, This is the Cultural Connections Podcast. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Ives, and I am the producer and host of the Cultural Connections Podcast. Before I introduce our guest today, I want to remind all of our viewers that we are recording this episode live on uh, Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. And we that means that if you have a question for our guest and you're watching us live here on Facebook, please feel free to comment below uh, and we will get your questions answered for you during the duration of the podcast. So without further ado, today's topic on the show is a timely one, as we now are quickly, hard to believe, approaching the holiday season. And it means that you got to start thinking about cooking for the holiday and getting your getting food ready. And we have a great episode here for you because we are joined by Todd Huberlein, the executive chef for Valente Farms in Needham, Massachusetts. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thank you. Well, before we go any further, I'd like you to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background. All right. Um, I have been cooking for a long time, probably uh, 33 years. So pretty much right out of uh, high school, I went to cooking school, uh, lived on the West Coast for about 12 years, uh, and then have been back here for a long time, uh, working on farms in New England for the last 20 years. That's impressive. What an impressive background. And before we go further, for our viewers that don't know and I, I, that aren't local to the area to know, can you give us a little bit of background on Valente Farms and what Valente Farms is, where it's located, and a little bit of the background story behind it? Absolutely. So the uh, Valente Farms, the family uh, is in the fourth generation. They've been farming for about 107 years. The original farm was actually in Newton off of Parker Street, and they moved to Needham back in 1961, uh, 292 Fire Street. And uh, the current generation now built a farm stand uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, it used to just be a three season, just a lot of small greenhouses. Now we're year round uh, and we have um, obviously a kitchen, a deli, bakery, uh, craft beer and wine, uh, ice cream, and then just all sorts of really great local products uh, to share with the community. That's great. Pretty much everything. <laughs> you have yeah. everything here. Ideally. Ideally, it seems that way. All right. Well, with, with that said, let's the whole purpose of this show is to get into the idea of holiday cooking, preparing for the holidays. And Valente Farms does a stellar job at that. They even have a you have a specialized menu that people can order from for the holidays. Walk us through that menu and some of the items that you offer that uh, for the holidays that are popular, let's say, for that people go that are their go to's for the holiday season. Sure. It's, um, you know, we try to get a pretty good variety going uh, and the menu that we've been working on for the last bunch of years is really tried and true. Uh, so the main, you know, we have a butcher shop, so uh, we, we sell a lot of roast, a lot of tenderloin roast, prime rib, uh, lots of good cuts of beef like that. And so the idea of what I do in the kitchen with the rest of the staff is things that will go along with those main courses. So, you know, from the meat aspect, we do a red wine demi and we do horseradish sauce and compound butters, all things that will go really well with the beef, uh, if that's what you're getting, and then sides. Um, and the winners are always mashed potatoes, mashed butternut squash. We get a lot of great local um, butternut squash right now. Um, we have... Um, Different, yeah, beef gravy I mentioned, but as, as much, I mean, I'm definitely an omnivore, but I have a lot of respect for vegetables and vegetarian food and so on. So we have a mushroom gravy, we have a vegetable gravy, we have a, a grain dish, a vegetable and grain dish that's vegan. So we really try to get something that uh, we can offer to everyone. That's great. And again, just to remind viewers before we go any further, I just want to remind everyone that you are watching or listening to the Cultural Connections podcast being recorded live on Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. And we are talking about the art of holiday cooking. So if you have questions, please feel free to comment below and we'll do our best to get them answered during this live broadcast. My next question to you is, how did you come up with the, the, this menu? What, what, what went into the thought process and how did you 
come up with this holiday menu? Well, um, a lot of it is guided by, you know, just what I like to eat, uh, you know, just a, a little background as a kid. Um, we, uh, most of our vegetables that we got that we had when I was growing up were uh, from the freezer, bird's eye, a lot of microwave stuff, a lot of uh, very peculiar stuff. Even though I grew up in New Jersey surrounded by farms, um, that didn't really come into play for us on the holidays. Um, so it's just, it's been trying, you know, trying different things for years and years. I mean, for every successful dish, there's one or two that just didn't cut it, that just didn't make it. And I want things to really shine. I want side dishes that are uh, approachable and common, but I also want some that are a, a little bit more than that. So, you know, we have like a mashed butternut squash, very simple butter, a little sugar, brown sugar and cinnamon. But then we also do a mashed butternut squash that has uh, caramelized onions and sage. And then we make a really nice um, chestnut breadcrumb topping. Um, and uh, again, it's I, I, listening to customers is always the way to go. I've been cooking for a long time, but a lot of times that doesn't mean anything. You have to listen to what people want. You have to watch what they're buying. And the nice thing about the farm stand is I can watch and see the produce that they're buying. So if I know that maybe one thing is a little more popular than the other, I'll gravitate towards that when I'm making a dish. Uh, the, the other bonus is we are a 30 acre farm. So we have a lot of great vegetables and a lot of the, my dishes are based around what we're growing. Um, the farm crew uh, needed a little help at the end of the summer picking sweet potatoes. And they asked anybody on the farm that wanted to do it for a couple hours. And I did, and it was so much fun. And I have a lot of respect for the farm crew. I can never do that full time. Um, but we pulled in 8,000 pounds of sweet potatoes. So my focus there is fun and different ways to enjoy sweet potatoes. Well, that's great. And um, then every, right, there, there must be a hidden dish that people wouldn't think about. What was the, 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 what, what is the, that hidden dish for the holidays that comes to mind that people wouldn't think about getting, but is definitely worth trying. Glad you asked that because that uh, I do have one. It's it's a wild mushroom stuffing, and you know, being someone who grew up on stovetop and loved it, uh, I wanted to make a stuffing that was just blew everybody's doors off. Something that no one would make at home. Uh, because it was so intense. So the wild mushroom stuffing is that dish. And it is a labor of love and one of the hardest things that we make there. Uh, and some of the new cooks always raise their eyebrows when they see how much work goes into it, but it really pays off. So we, you know, we saute, you know, eight or nine different mushrooms. We try to use wild mushrooms, any kind of variety that we have. Uh, we make our own mushroom stock. So it is a vegetarian stuffing. Uh, there's lots of kale and cherry and garlic. And uh, outside of the uh, farm kitchen, we have our own garden. So I grow a lot of the herbs that we use uh, for everything, thyme and sage and rosemary and such. Um, so that all goes in there, mushroom stock, um, bread, and then we make kind of like a custard. Um, so it's a baked stuffing, kind of like a bread pudding. And I mix together eggs and mascarpone cheese and Asiago cheese, and then finish it up with a little bit of black truffle butter. Uh, and then we bake that in the oven. And it, I can tell you, oh, and lots of kale, lots of homegrown kale. When that comes out of the oven, it just smells fantastic. And it's more because there's so many great things, ingredients in that dish that go so well together. Um, it really, that, that part of it does the work for you. And a very corny saying that I use in the kitchen is, if it grows together, it goes together. And this fall winter dish is definitely that one. It's it all sounds delicious, and I should say to the fact here is the Cultural Connections podcast is not responsible if we're making you hungry during this. <laughs> right over to Valente Farm <laughs> and purchasing some delicious food if you're hungry right now. That's what you should be doing instead of if we've made you hungry by the end of this podcast, hop on over there. Um, well, then what is then how you have crafted we you obviously base again a lot on what what you have available to you growing but how do you but ever but here in new england we have four seasons weather can change unpredictably at any minute we can have we had like this past summer a dry summer which i mean impacted a lot of growing of of, of uh, plants and gardens and stuff like that how does this impact your choices how do how do you alter then your choices when when situations like this arise um, well, and, and I don't work in the, in the field, so I, I don't know everything, but the, the last two years I know for the farm have been the most, uh, most challenging because the year before 
uh, we were flooded. There was so much rain and we lost so many crops. And it's just, it's really heartbreaking because I know the farm crew puts a lot of work in. And so you're planning a lot of things and, and you don't get them because again, there was too much water. This past season, there was a drought, which is very, very difficult. But um, the nice thing for us is that we have a great irrigation system. We have a 10,000 gallon rainwater collector in our greenhouse. So where if there was a drought, we ended up being able to keep everything going because we were able to irrigate and water everything along the way. Um, so again, last year's menu is different from this year. Last year, we didn't have 8,000 pounds of sweet potatoes, uh, but this year we, we also have a lot of winter crops. We have a lot of celery root and we have beets and carrots and greens that we're probably almost done with. And um, there are a lot of things that I do in the kitchen uh, to prolong the, um, the harvest as much as possible. So we dehydrate, we can, we freeze, we pickle, we ferment. We, anything that we can do to extend uh, the season is what I like to do. And a good example, even though it's not holiday-ish, is uh, we do a dish that's um, uh, pasta and meatballs, but I wanted it to be different. So it's, it's they're actually beet balls and we make the same, we smoke them and roast the beets and we make, make them just like you would meatballs with cheese and herbs and oregano and stuff. Uh, and then carrot pasta. So we are able to store the beets and the carrots through the cold times and use them to make these items. We dehydrate the carrots to make the carrot powder to make the pasta. And again, you have to be, you have to be really inventive on how to store things uh, through the winter lean months. Yeah, absolutely. It's def definitely. Um, well, another big thing that recently happened was you, one of your own recipes was featured in the, on the cover of a local magazine. Can you tell us about that and what that recipe was and everything? Yeah, uh, there was, um, it was the Edible Boston's, the winter issue, which is a great magazine. The whole edible community all over the country is really focuses on the lots of smaller places and individuals that are really trying to be more sustainable and more uh, uh, close to the ground, if you will. Um, and I've always, I, I mean, I like everything about food. It's very cliche for a chef to say that. I love it. I'm passionate, all that jazz, but I love to talk about it and I love to write about it. And I've been wanting to write for a while. So I've pitched a story to Edible Boston uh, about winter cooking, and that's what it was. And the cover recipe, one of my favorite soups, um, and the whole article, I wanted to focus on maybe some root vegetables and things that people don't normally gravitate towards. Uh, so it was a celery root soup with braised fennel and local apples. And it, it's just a really great uh, combination of flavors. Again, we're going to do that. If it grows together, it goes together. And uh, that's, it's, it's a, a really simple soup. And I didn't know that they were going to put that on the cover until it actually arrived uh, at the farm stand. And then we have couples, a couple different salads in there um, and uh, uh, an entree as well. Um, and yeah, I was, I was very lucky and I was very excited to be able to write that. It's incredible. It really, and it's incredible and it's a big accomplishment. Let's talk about as well, because obviously there's holiday cooking and then there's also, I mean, just regular dishes that are so popular at Valente Farms in your kitchen area. What are some of the most popular dishes, just in general terms speaking, that someone might not think of that are? Well, we, we again, we do we do some common things. You know, people, we, we listen to what people want. So we do a lot of chicken salad, we do tuna salad, we do a lot of those things. Um, but then I want to do common things that, people can identify with, but slightly different. So probably one of our, our two biggest dishes, uh, one is a turkey chili, and it's it's a very simple, basic um, recipe, but we use ground, uh, ground dark meat turkey that we get from Vermont. And again, I'm an omnivore, I like beef, pork, everything, but I like the turkey more because it's leaner. It has a whole different flavor uh, that I really, really enjoy. So that, that one, it, it's amazing how much we go through uh, with that. And then funny enough, one of the other big ones is a turkey meatloaf. And the idea there was that all the ingredients that you would kind of think about with Thanksgiving, like uh, carrots and poultry seasoning and herbs and things like that. That one also is one of our more, one of our more popular ones. And the um, the beef balls with carrot pasta. It, also, we don't do it all the time because it's a lot of work. We're um, we're asking Santa for an automated pasta maker next year, so hopefully we'll be able to see more of that on the regular. 
Um, but yeah, I think those are those are a few of the the top ones. And soups, we 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 just we we sell so many soups and and root vegetables this time of year. I, I always go for because I think they they really do a lot of uh, they have a lot of great flavor and when they're done the right way, they really stand out. So that's impressive. Let's talk about the soups for a minute because it is soups are a holiday meal and in this time of year when it's cold and dreary like it is today as we're recording live. Yeah. Soup is Good thing to go with. Let's talk about what what kind of soups do you have? And does Valenti's offer? And uh, and uh, yeah, tell us about the soups. Well, we have the the aforementioned uh, celery root soup with the fennel and the apples. But our our absolute star, and it's funny because we've had to change the name. Is we call it fall harvest soup, and it's it's a mix of everything is roasted in the oven. It's rutabaga, celery root, parsnips, um, carrots. Uh, yeah, I think that's most of it. Uh, we roast all those with a little bit of butter in the oven, and then we saute onions and garlic, and we add all those root vegetables to it. And one of the neat things that we do at the farm is, uh, like I mentioned, we make a mashed butternut squash. So you're making it like mashed potatoes. You're putting squash in a pot of water, boiling it until it's done, and then draining it. But when we drain it, we save that butternut water, we call it, and we use that as the base in the soup. So the, the idea is that you're trying to utilize as much as you can out of everything that you're doing. And rather than adding a stock to the fall harvest soup, you're just adding more butternut squash flavor into it. Uh, and so all that simmers for a while, and we finish it with a little nutmeg and sage and and that's it and it's just it's really great roasted parsnip rutabaga celery root the really really great vegetables that i think everyone should use a bit more of thought so that's our main soup right now um we also do um <laughs> we are our version of chicken soup i call grandma's chicken soup um, because i know a lot of places call it mom's chicken soup so i thought well i, I gotta do it a little bit better um, right. so our grandma's chicken soup we Again, we roast a lot of vegetables, we roast the chicken, and then when we cook it all, we add chicken stock to it. So it's kind of what we would call a fortified stock. So it's a lot richer uh, and the stock, the broth is a lot darker and has a more robust flavor. And I really love it. And it, it actually took a while um, to get a lot of people to go for it because the it's a lot darker than you would think of chicken soup. Um, but it, that's one of those things where I'm trying to get people to understand the extra step that we're making uh, to make it really enjoyable for them. And then the funny part about the grandma or mom's chicken soup, the only soup we had when I grew up was Campbell's. So there wasn't really, my grandmother wasn't really making anything remotely close to this. So uh, yeah. that's another good one. I see. But let's talk about some of the, then what is, would you say, uh, out of the your menu of your regular items that you offer on a regular basis, what is some of the most popular dishes that, pe that are people's go-tos at Volante? What are the most popular dishes that you would say people go uh, for? Um, well, we do we do a lot of risottos. I'm, I'm a big fan of risottos, and we do we try to keep things pretty seasonal. Um, so right now we're doing uh, a roasted pumpkin risotto, which is one of my favorites. And again, what we do is between the pastry kitchen and my kitchen, uh, we roast a lot of pumpkin this time of year. And what we do is we strain it, we hang it in cheesecloth in the strainer uh, for, for a day just to get all the liquid out. And uh, again, we're, so we're using this pumpkin stock to make the pumpkin risotto. And we're just trying to build flavor on flavor on flavor. Um, and so the risotto is very popular. popular. The wild mushroom risotto it also is very popular. Um, one thing, even though it's not a main dish, um, that's been a, a, a really surprising popular item over the years has been hummus. Now, hummus, I mean, you can get hummus anywhere. Uh, right. And sorry. No, I'm listening. Go uh, ahead. Um, you, you can get hummus anywhere. And we, what we make is just a, just a really good basic hummus with garlic, roasted garlic and cumin and lemon and tahini and all that. But then as the years went by, I kept adding different flavors. So we do, then we did a roasted pepper one. And then, then um, a while back, actually for our centennial in 2017, uh, we wrote a cookbook that was also a, a history about the family uh, farming and on the cover is the beet hummus. So what I try to do with the different hummus is, is not just throw a wacky ingredient in it. I change the whole flavor. So um, we roast the beets with sitar seasoning, which is a really nice mixture of thyme and sumac and sesame seeds. And that's what we make the beet hummus with. And then we expanded the next one was carrot hummus. And that one we roast with uh, a seasoning called Ras El Huat, 
which is uh, really nice kind of Moroccan, really nice flavor spice. Um, and then the carrot hummus got really popular. And then we did, uh, we use fresh garbanzo, green garbanzo beans, and we make a green one and that has smoked poblano and agave syrup and a little cilantro. And then the one that is the absolute winner is our Southwestern corn hummus. And it's, so we grow corn and fresh corn. I mean, fresh corn is always the best, but seasonally it's always the best. And the Southwestern one has scallions and a little cumin and lemon. And it, it, it blew up from the first time we started making it maybe five years ago. Um, and one of the important things that I always talk about, and I mean, we sell tons of it, but we're not making it right now. And a lot of people say, hey, I, I want to buy it. Why can't I buy it? And I say, because the corn right now is not good. And that's the whole idea of seasonal cooking. I could sell it now and we could make that money and that'd be great, but it's not going to be the quality that they're used to. And I refuse to do that just to make a buck. They, you know, if they have to wait until next summer, sorry, you know, we do our best to have as much corn as we can to prolong it. But um, that that's, that's really important to me. And there are a lot of dishes that are seasonal because I refuse to make anything out of season as much as I can. So, um, yeah, the hummus has been a, has been a real winner the, over the years. Oh, sounds delicious. Uh, before we go any further, I want to remind all of our viewers that we are recording this episode live here on the Cultural Connections podcast. If you're tuning in uh, with us live here, we are live on Facebook on Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. And you're listening or watching the Cultural Connections podcast, the art of holiday cooking and in general cooking as we talk about food here. Uh, let's talk about, you mentioned for the centennial of the Valente Farms that you they came out with a cookbook. Let's talk about that some of the recipes that are in that cookbook that people wouldn't think about, like that are not your typical recipes that people would think about uh, in that. Um, uh, so what are some of the recipes in that cookbook? Let's talk about that cookbook for a minute. Give us a little bit of background on it. Sure. So the, the original idea of the book started from the head farmer, Ryan Conroy, and he's been at the farm for years. And he's, he's really amazing. And and I, you know, whenever I can, I just make a really big point of letting people know, customers and so on, that it really doesn't matter what I do or as a team, what we do in the kitchen. It's the farmers that are getting us the great food. And, and that's really the first step. Uh, so I always give them all credit. So Ryan had wanted to write uh, a history book about the Volantes uh, for the centennial. And then it kind of morphed into a cookbook idea also. So it's really neat. As I mentioned, there's four generations that have been farming. Uh, and so we broke it up into four chapters for each season, for each generation. And uh, we did a lot of fun stuff. I'm not, I'm not into doing recipes that pretty much no one will make or that they have to buy 20 ingredients that they'll use once. It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather have a book that is stained and dog-eared and people use all the time. So we did a lot. I tried to keep it fairly simple. Um, let's see some of the different recipes. Well, obviously the, um, the beet hummus, like I mentioned, um, I, I'm a huge rhubarb fan. I think rhubarb is wonderful and it can be used in a lot of different ways. So one of the recipes in there is a rhubarb thyme jam. So um, it has white wine and orange juice and thyme and star anise and uh, candy ginger and rhubarb, obviously. And it's great if you like to spread it on toast. Um, but I also use it as a glaze on a roasted pork loin that's very popular. So um, that one's a little bit different. Uh, with each chapter, we did a cocktail. So there's even a, um, there's a parsnip daiquiri in there. And as crazy as that sounds, it really works when it's done the right way. Just a very simple um, recipe for a syrup to make a cocktail with. Um, and then um, I... I I have to mention now that we're along this way, the, the pastry chef at Volantes is my wife, Jen, and oh. she is amazing. And she wrote all the dessert recipes in there. And in the past, uh, over the years, we've been doing dinners in the field, which are a really big, uh, wonderful event that we do in the summer. Uh, the menu's all based around what we're growing at the time, a hundred people right out there in the field. And early on, um, you know, the kind of discussions with dessert were what can we use that we grow for dessert. And one of the things that stands out the most to me is she made this beautiful red velvet cake and it was absolutely delicious. And the red was not red dye number five, like you might be used to, it was roasted beets. 
and it works and it's good and it's in the cookbook and it's wonderful. And then her garnish we made, there are different types of beets. Uh, one of my favorites is a chayoga or a candy stripe. So it's um, layers of red and white stripes. So what she did is she cut those really thin, cooked them in a simple syrup, dried them with a little sugar on it. And so it's like a chip and that would garnish uh, the red velvet cake. So I think that's one of the most extraordinary recipes in the book. That and the um, the carrot whoopie pies. It's very dangerous being married to her, but she doesn't <laughs> let me eat it all. So, you know, it works out, I guess. You imagine, boy, it's a whole family affair there. Yep. You, cooking competitions. <laughs> With all of this being said, the, 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 let's just talk about, in general terms, what is your favorite dish to, that you to make then at, at Valente Farms? What is your favorite dish that you like? Oh, don't do that to me, Brian. Uh, it's like asking me my favorite kid, right? Um, it's, I, I really like the, the, the beet balls with carrot pasta. Um, in the spring, so we leave a lot of parsnips in the ground over the winter, um, and we and they get uh, harvested in the spring. And one of the dishes that's actually in the cookbook also is we do a parsnip gnocchi. And 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 again, we're doing something that people know, like a gnocchi, uh, which could either be made with ricotta or potato. But we do the rutabaga, and again, it's 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 not the idea that it's wacky or whimsical. It's just really good. Spring dug parsnips are delicious. Um, so when you just have a very simple dish with maybe spinach and some spring asparagus. It really, really goes well. So that's one of my favorites. Um, the mushroom stuffing, obviously, which I can't get enough of. And actually, my we just started making a new fall salad uh, with wheat berries, uh, roasted squash, pumpkin seeds, and we do a roasted apple vinaigrette. Um, and, and again, I like uh, uh, salad dressings at the farm we have a lot of different ones through the season and again I always like trying doing uh, different things so the roasted apple vinaigrette is just great because we're getting local apples from sunny crest orchards so you're really you're again you're starting with great ingredients and you know I'm we're able to do a little bit of this and that and together local ingredients and some good you know hard work make things really stand out um, another one in the summer we do a, a roasted carrot vinaigrette uh, and that that also is one of my favorites. So, oh, and, and sorry, one more. We we make our own bacon there, which we use for breakfast sandwiches, and then in the kitchen for other things. And we've been and BLTs in the summer. We've been making our own bacon since the first year we opened, and we we make anywhere between a hundred to three hundred pounds a week. So I guess you could say I do love my bacon. Uh, it sounds that way. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, this episode, has, as I, like I said at the, earlier on in the podcast, if you are watching or listening to this episode and you're hungry now, you should be going over to Valencia Farms and picking up some delicious food over there. You're, 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 it's worth it. Trust me, it is worth it. But it's hard to think that with all of the all of this food and deliciousness that we've been talking, that we're already reaching now towards the end of our podcast here. I want to. I want to thank Todd for joining me today and discussing all of this. And I hope that it gives you some in, at home, some enlightening ideas of what you can do for the holiday cooking. And if you want, uh, want to get, uh, get the good catering food for the holiday season, check in, talk to Todd at Valenti's. He'll be glad to talk to you. Uh, otherwise, I want to thank Todd for joining me today. And if you have questions or comments about today's show or future suggestions for other episodes of the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me directly at brianives at gmail.com. That's B-R-I-A-N-I-V-E-S at gmail.com. Uh, and thank you again, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you next time on the Cultural Connections podcast. I'm Brian Ives, and I'm the producer and host of the Cultural Connections podcast. Thanks for watching. Thank you again for watching this episode of the Cultural Connections podcast. For more information on today's episode, be sure to check out our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also watch this episode again in its entirety on our YouTube channel. This podcast is also available on listening platforms Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Breaker, Radio Public, and New TV. Thanks again for watching this episode of the Cultural Connections podcast.